Someone put together funny tips for married couples, and I want to give them to you this morning. The best way to remember your anniversary is to forget it once. Never laugh at your spouse's choices. You are one of them. Marriage lets you annoy one another, one special person for the rest of your life. Marry someone who has a different favorite cereal than you so they won't eat all of yours. A good marriage is one where each partner secretly suspects that they got the better deal. If your wife says she'll be ready in five minutes, She's using the same time scale as when you say the game has five minutes left. In marriage, you don't need Google. Your spouse knows everything. (laughs) In marriage, the best way to get the last word is to apologize. The key to successful marriage is to agree that only one of you can be crazy at a time. The perfect marriage is just two imperfect people who refuse to give up on each other. And the last one is very important. The most romantic love story isn't Romeo and Juliet, Juliet who died together, but Grandma and Grandpa who grew old together. And I like that one. That one's good. Some of these are funny and some of them are truthful, very truthful. Have you ever given thought to how many self-books there are out there on how to have a healthy marriage? There is a ton of them. Go to the bookstore. You'll see what I'm talking about. Some of them are good, and I dare say that some of them are no good. You've got to be careful. Always be careful of the books that you're reading. However, I know one book that is more helpful than all the other books put together, and this book is truthful and accurate. And this book was written by the one who made male and female and created the institution of marriage. You know who I'm talking about. It is the Bible, and Jesus is the one, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who wrote it. In the Bible, the book of James uh, tells that there is a formula of how to change a marriage from a duel to a duet. And that's what we want. <laughs> If you follow just one verse in the Bible, it can do wonders for your marriage. If you'll just follow one verse, it will do wonders. And that verse today is found in James chapter 1, verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Wonderful verse. We're going to look at that today. It's it's common for conflict to show up in marriage. Uh, Pretty much every marriage is going to have conflict. Someone said, marriage is when a man and woman become one. The trouble starts when they try to decide which one. One woman said, my husband and I have agreed to never go to bed angry with each other. So far, we've been up for three days. (laughs) Well, conflict is essentially a part of every marriage. Uh, It's the human nature And I would tell you that after Adam sinned in the garden, conflict ensued. That's what happened. When God asked Adam if he had eaten of the forbidden tree, he didn't simply say yes. He said, the woman that you gave me, gave me the fruit and I did eat. Now I'm going to tell you the thing about that verse is Adam indirectly blamed God And he directly blamed the woman. But then the woman then turned around and blamed the serpent. You'll find a lot of blame. There's conflict that is there. But I'll tell you that when sin enters into the world, there's going to be conflict. Because sin that is there. In fact, God said that one of the results of sin would be the conflict between the man and the woman. And so the wife would desire to control the husband and the husband would try to dominate the woman by force. This is a conflict that we have in our world today. In observing some marriages, I would tell you that you would think that they were married by the secretary of war rather than the justice of peace. And we've all observed that. Hopefully not your marriage. The apostle Paul taught that one of the fruits of the flesh Our sin nature is discord. You'll find that in Galatians chapter 5. There's discord. 
And we're prone to offend others and to be offended and to withhold forgiveness and to divide. That's what we're prone to. That's something that we have to guard and we have to be careful of. And uh, sadly, all of these behaviors are prone to blossom within the marriage union. Married couples must understand that conflicts are inevitable and it is their duty to seek God and resolve their conflicts. That's important. Dr. Al Mohler that I saw just a couple of weeks ago, he said, marriage is about our happiness, our holiness, and our wholeness, but it is supremely about the glory of God. And I love that statement. He's absolutely right. Because of sin in this world, we are going to face conflicts. We know that it's going to happen. However, in our text today, James reveals to us how we are to handle these conflicts. Now let's look at these three areas here in James chapter 1 and verse 19 in greater detail. First of all, James instructs us to tune in. Uh, There in that verse, it says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. And uh, this is talking about the awesome power of the listening ear. Uh, psychologists tell us that we only catch about 20% of what we hear. That's a discouraging to a pastor when he's thinking about preaching a message today. But um, hopefully you can pick up a little bit more than 20%. But if you hear the right 20%, that might be good. But many times uh, what we hear is kind of garbled. We're, we're not paying attention. And someone, and we've all been guilty of this, when someone has finished speaking, we don't remember what they said, you know, because we're not paying attention. The wise Solomon tells us in Proverbs 18, 2, a fool has no delight in understanding, but in in expressing his own heart. In other words, he's not going to listen. He didn't want to hear anything that you have to say. Wisdom begins when we listen more than what we talk. And so, first of all, we must listen to our master, Jesus, once again, uh, we remember in the scripture, says, he who, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. If you got ears, you need to be listening, hearing to what God has to say. We live in a world today that does not want to listen to the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. They willingly close their ears to the truth. And sad to say, many people in our churches are not listening to what God says. A.W. Tozier, that great preacher and writer from years past, once said, most Christians don't hear God's voice because they've already decided we aren't going to do what he says. And he's right about that. A lot of people don't want to hear because they don't want to do what God says. Some Christians want to know why God isn't speaking to them, yet they are not listening. Perhaps God is, but they just aren't listening. Sometimes God stays silent until we're ready to listen. That takes place. Would to God that we would have more believers like the, the, the prophet, the priest, uh, Samuel in the Bible. Uh, when God was speaking to him, he said, speak for your servant hears. That ought to be our statement to the Lord. Speak for your servant hears. Most Christians, they, they, um, they struggle listening to what God has to say. I like what one person said, when you pray, God listens, and when you listen, God talks. When you believe, God works. That's a good statement. Because we're talking about the duties of the home, I want to be very quick to go on and say we must listen to our mate. That's the second thing. We're speaking about marriage. James said, be swift to hear. Heard about a man who was married to his wife for about 30 years, and he became very frustrated in their marriage because she would, wouldn't answer him. Uh, when he um, said things, she wouldn't answer. And he suspected that her hearing was going. That was the problem. And she would admit it, so he decided to do a test on her. And when she was not looking uh, toward him, she's on the other side of the room. He was on the other side of the room, and uh, he said very quietly, can you hear me? And she didn't turn around. 
He got a little closer and said, can you hear me? She didn't turn around. And uh, third time, can you hear me? Nothing. Fourth time, he's right behind her and said, can you hear me? And suddenly she spun around from her chair and said with a slight aggravation in her voice, for the fourth time, yes, I can hear you. I heard a funny statement, but it could be true that the reason why wives say twice as many words in a day as their husbands is because the husband didn't hear her the first time when she said it. And truthfully, that could go either way. All good communication, all good marriages communicate, and that communication begins with listening. You you can bank on it. Every good marriage is going to have good communication. And in the marriage, active listening involves empathy and, and respect and, and genuine in, interest. And if you're committed to your marriage, my friend, you will take a real interest in what your wife is saying or what your husband is saying. Pay attention to the tone of voice, the facial expression, the, <coughs> the eye contact, the physical gestures of your mate. You look at all those. There was a study done in 2016 that explored the impact of active listening on relationship uh, satisfaction. And they found that the findings in that study reveal that couples, hear me now couples, this is important, that engaged in active listening reported higher levels of marital happiness and lower levels of conflict. And these couples also demonstrated greater emotional uh, intimacy and a strong sense of mutual support because they learned to listen to one another. James was inspired by God. Remember that now. James was inspired by God when he wrote the words swift to hear. You need to be swift to hear. And by practicing active listening in your marriage, you demonstrate your commitment to your mate's well-being and your desire to have growth in your relationship. That's what you do. Second point today is James instructs us to tone down. Not only listen up, but uh, tone down, or to tune in, but tone down. Verse 19, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be slow to speak. Not only listen, but slow to speak. Hopefully, we all understand that our tongues can get us in a lot of trouble. We've all been there, have we not? We all have. Thomas Fuller said, learn to hold thy tongue. Five words cost Zacharias 40 weeks of That's pretty good, is it not? I like that statement. If the tongue isn't tamed, it will destroy your marriage. Couples, you that are married here today, that, but that only goes in marriage. It goes for every aspect. But it can destroy your marriage if your tongue is not tamed. James tells us just how the, the dangerous the tongue can be. James deals a lot with, with uh, the tongue. He says in chapter 3 and verse 6, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Talking about the tongue. In other words, we can burn down our marriage with our tongue. Only with our tongue. We can burn it down. Then two verses later, he says, the tongue, it is an unruly evil uh, full of deadly poison. Someone said the tongue has no bones, but it is strong enough to break a heart. Be careful with your words. And, but James is saying here, the tongue can poison the love in your home. It can. The tongue can do that. So in your marriage, don't use your tongue to do seven things. I'm going to give them to you real quick. You're thinking, wow, from these notes today, he does have a long sermon. But we're going to go through it quick. Don't play the judge with your tongue. Don't play the judge. As the judge, we blame and we condemn our partner. Never say to your partner, It is all your fault. You should be ashamed. We never say that. Don't start the sentence with you in the argument. For example, you always or you never. You're going to be in trouble. Your tongue's already getting you in trouble if you do that. 
And we almost always, we're almost always wrong when we use the word always in dealing in marriage. Instead, begin with, I feel this way, or I think this or that. That's a better way to start. Henry Ward Beecher, you hear me quote him quite often, great preacher of the past. He said, compassion will cure more sins than condemnation. And he's right. Number two, don't play the professor. Uh, This is when you talk down to the other person. And it's acting superior and uh, constantly putting down or belittling your mate. And when we attack our our partner's self-worth, our partner will get defensive. And besides, the Bible tells us, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. That's what we're to do. Third of all, don't play the, the psychologist. Don't sit around and try to analyze your mate. Don't do that. Well, let me tell you why you said that. <laughs> or let me tell you why you think that way. You know, some might say that. You're trying to play the, the psychologist. And we shouldn't do this because we don't know, and they may not know uh, either. James chapter 4, uh, he wa- warns us again about judging the motives of others. Number four, don't play the historian. The, historian, uh, the historians correct the details of every story that their partner tells. Don't contradict or, or correct your, your mate unless it is absolutely necessary. Just don't do it. Some people play the historian when they're losing an argument. You know, they want to bring up things from the past that have nothing to do with what you were dealing with at the time. And besides, aren't we supposed to forgive and forget? Number five, don't play the dictator. These are those who use force in their marriage. They may, view, they may use a verbal force. Um, and let me say, beware of ultimatums in marriage. That, that's a, a dangerous thing. Keep your words warm and sweet uh, because you may have to eat them. Worse than an ultimatum is a, 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 a veiled threat. If you do that, again, wait and see what happens. Those are threats that should never be done, ever be done. And the dictator is the person who changes the marriage relationship from I do to you better, you had better do this or do that. There are very few people as low as a man that would ever lift his hand to his wife. That's about as low as you can get. Men, don't you ever even think. Thought never ever came to my mind to ever put my hand to my wife. And you know what? Sometimes wives physically beat up their husbands too. I've heard of cases like that, and, and that, that is true. But dictatorship in marriage is cruel. It's a cruel thing. And it says to the partner, I can do a better job with your life than you can. And that's not up to us. That's up to God. And that, what will happen is it will rob that person of their self-esteem. Then number six, don't play the critic. Don't condemn your partner. Don't criticize your partner. And above all, don't compare your partner. Don't compare your mate to someone else's mate. God help you. Don't you ever do that. Don't compare your partner to their mother or their father. Don't do that. Never criticize something, uh, criticize them over something that that person has no control over. They have no control over who their parents were. They have no control over their physical traits. Uh, They have no control over their attributes. And so don't condemn them for that. And the truth of the matter is that when we point a finger at our mate, we've got three more pointing back at us. Is that not true? We need all, I was told that as a kid. Remember, when you point your finger at somebody, you got three pointing back at you. We need to always remember that. But I just love what Elizabeth George said. It is hard to criticize someone if you're praying for them. That's true. What a wonderful statement. So someone else said, spend so much time improving yourself that you have no time left to criticize others. That's another good statement. Number seven, don't play the preacher. Don't do that. And this is perhaps the most insidious of all. It's assuming a sort of 
holier-than-thou attitude. And that can happen in marriage. It's attempting to become his or her conscience. It's trying to be the Holy Spirit. And sometimes people will even use the Bible to try to, uh, as a club to try to beat up their partner with. And uh, this is destructive in, in marriage uh, relationships. Yes, build your wife, life on the word of God, but don't lecture with a holier-than-thou attitude. Don't do that. Ruth Graham said that it's, the, which is Billy Graham's daughter, said that it is the wife's job, or it was his wife, I'm sorry, said that it is the wife's job to love her husband. It is God's job to make him good. And I like that. That's a good statement. Let's move on to our last point today. James instructs us to tighten up. And there in verse 19, So then, my bro- beloved brethren, let every man be slow to wrath. That's the last part of the verse. And we're called to tighten up and be slow to wrath. Someone said, he who conquers his wrath overcomes his greatest enemy. And that's true. James goes on to say in the very next verse, verse 20, for the wrath of the man does not produce the righteousness of God. And that's absolutely true. We can't afford to have wrath and conflict in our homes. We can't afford to have that. And we're to resolve uh, our hearts, not dissolve our homes. But a lot of homes are being dissolved today. So, first of all, we see eliminate conflict with these three don'ts. These three don'ts. Don't practice avoidance. This is where we retreat and we avoid confrontation. Don't do that. Communication is no doubt one of the hardest parts of sustaining a healthy uh, relationship or marriage. And as time passes, couples get used to each other and they assume that their counterpart understands how they feel at all times. That's what happens. And couples also tend to avoid certain subjects, to sidestep a a fight or a, a tough conversation that they don't want to they don't want to have and it's natural to want to avoid conflict it's natural but sometimes avoiding conflict now leads to a a larger conflict down the road and sometimes we have we we have to be careful of that and we have the idea that it will go away (coughs) but with God's help you need to work through all those problems Corey Ten Boom said When a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit still and trust the engineer. And that's a pretty good statement. Second of all, don't practice appeasement. Uh, Some just avoid conflict uh, by just appeasing. You know, they just appease. Oftentimes, that might be the woman, but sometimes it's the man. Sometimes one person dominates and they get their, his or her way when the other person just appeases and always gives in. That happens in marriages all the time. And to compromise is one thing. That is where they both give. But to appease is another matter. You see, the person who appeases, it, they internalize the problem. It stays within them and it eats away at them. And when their spouse gets ugly, they just stay silent and they internalize uh, these problems, and uh, they just give way. They give way, they give way, and then it becomes in their heart like smoldering rags. It becomes a problem to them. An appeaser is prone to self-pity. Uh, they, they have the martyr complex, and they feel trapped because they will never be hurt, so they think. And while the marriage may stay together, they, they really have an emotional divorce. They are separated from each other. So you can't practice appeasement and have a good marriage. And then third of all, don't practice aggression. If there's conflict, then you've got to, you've got to, have, you've got to communicate with your partner. But you must do it the way the Bible says to do it, and that is speak the truth in love. That's the way it should be done. Sarcasm is never in order. A lot of people like to use sarcasm. I don't recommend that in marriage at all. The, when Adam told Eve, 
you're the most beautiful woman in the world. Some say that she was sarcastic when she said, and my dear Adam, you are the smartest man in the world. You know, so uh, she was being sarcastic, some would say. But there are a few problems that a husband and wife cannot solve if they will attack the problem rather than, than one another. There are a few that, that you can work through these things. Um, people say, well, I don't love them anymore, can't work through this. You made a commitment is what you did. You can work through it. Don't say it can't be done. It can be done. With God, all things are possible. Remember that. Choose the right time when you confront. Choose the right tone when you confront. The Bible says a, a soft answer turns away wrath. And also choose the right turf for your, your uh, con, confr confrontation. And this important time of communication is never to be in front of your parents. God help you. Don't talk about all these problems to your parents. And it's certainly not in front of your children. Parents, don't do that. Don't talk about your problems in front of your children. Wayne Mack said, wherever you find marital failure, you will find a breakdown in real communication. Wherever you find marital success, you will find good, a good communication system. And he's right. So I want you to notice with me, then second of all, eliminate conflict with these three do's. There's three things, three important do's that we should do. We'll close out with today. First of all, learn to practice accommodation. Many times we want to change our partner, but in reality, we ought to be working on changing ourselves rather than trying to change them. And listen to me carefully. I believe this with all of my heart. Because most times, I really do believe that you can change your partner by changing yourself. If you'll change yourself, you will change your partner. I'm, in most cases, uh, that will be true. Your mate will recognize that you're a changed person for the better. That you're walking with God, you love the Lord, and that you've got a pure heart. Your, your mate will recognize that. Billy Sunday once said, try praising your wife even if it does frighten her at first. I like that. But accommodation is when a man learns what kind of, of romance his wife likes, and he learns to love that too. Uh, accommodation is when a woman learns the sport her husband loves, and he, she's learned to love that with him too. These things, and we can go on down. That's just two illustrations. There are many things I can give. But they both get what they want, and they enjoy it together. Everyone here can improve on their accommodating of their partner. Everybody can. Second of all, learn to practice acceptance. Men and, men and women are equal before God. However, equality of worth is not the sameness as function. Understand that. God has put headship in the home. That's what the Bible teaches. The world doesn't like that today, but it's true. But you see, when the husband is the head of the home, you want me to tell you what that means? That means he has more responsibility. That's what it means. And this does not mean that he is superior. It does not mean that at all. And you are never more like the devil than when you are an un unsubmissive spirit. Thank you, baby. I appreciate it. <laughs> Who knows? It might help. <laughs> so, but you're never more like the devil when you have an unsubmissive spirit. But hear me, you are never more like Jesus than when you have a submissive spirit. And in the, in the, uh, if the husband does not accept his God-given role in the home, he's a shirker, he's a slacker, and he's a failure of a husband. And I would tell you that if a wife does not accept her God-given role in the home, that she has a rebellious spirit. The Bible makes that very clear. Acceptance is not only about roles. I've been giving you roles, but it's not only about that, but it's also our person. I'm talking about who we are. Uh, it's about that we accept who they are. People come from different backgrounds, and they have different ways of doing things. When you put a man and a woman together, they come from different backgrounds. They're raised different. Sometimes raised in different 
um, cities and different counties, different states, different countries sometimes it, it is that way. And uh, if their ways are honorable, but yet they are different than yours, you got to learn to accept the ways that they are. Remember this. You married them knowing that they were that way. Don't ever forget that. You come along, well, I don't like the way, well, if it has, if it's not anything that's unbiblical, you knew that, you married them, you asked God to help you accept that. I'm sure there's some things we all, husband and wife, have different things that, you know, are different that we may not like, but we ask God to help us accept that. We all have that. Uh, ask God to help you to accept the differences. And then last of all, learn to practice adjustment. Paul said, Philippians 2, 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but for the interest of others. That's a good one, isn't it? Uh, you can adjust by submitting uh, to each other. Think about what your spouse needs. Today, you're marrying. Think about what your spouse needs. That is giving up what you want in order to meet the needs of your spouse, whatever their, their needs are. It may be watching what, it, something as simple as watching what your mate wants to watch on television or going to a restaurant that they want to go to you know, rather than the one you want to go to. And it may be, or you might be like my wife, and I told Chip Keller this the other day. I told him, Chip, you're as bad as my wife. We're going somewhere to try to figure out where we're going to eat. And I said, where do you want to go? And he didn't know, and I didn't know where I wanted to go. I told him, you're as bad as the knees. We ride down the road and couldn't figure out where we wanted to go, you know. But wherever the other one wants to, you know, go, uh, take turns, you know, where you want to go. It may be going to bed at a different time than what you're used to going to bed to uh, uh, normally. But the test of real love isn't in what you say, but it is in the way you act. That's important. And when your love is mature, you'll treat your mate like Jesus would. The Bible says in 1 John three sixteen for... This we know love. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. If he gave to lay down his life for us, that's the example for us of what we ought to do for that one whom we love. Make the adjustments to love your spouse like Christ does. And that decision, it'll change everything. It'll change everything in your marriage. Peter Marshall stated the following about marriage relationship. When rightfully understood and properly appreciated is the most delightful as well as the most sacred and solemn of all human relations. It is the clasping of hands, the blending of lives, and the union of hearts that too may walk together bearing life's burdens, discharging its duties, and sharing its joys and sorrows. And he's absolutely right. The home, our marriages... They're under attack today. We understand that by our society, certainly by Satan, in our world. But marriage will ever remain in the sight of God, an eternal union made possible only by the gift of love that God alone can bestow. Only the gift of love that God can bestow. God is one that gives us love, God is the one that gives us good marriages, and good marriages are kept by God's grace. That's why, in order to have a right relationship with your marriage, uh, and with your mate, you got to first have a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And I ask you today, friend, do you know him personally? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? If not, you can pray to him today and ask him to come into your heart and your life and give you eternal life. Call on Jesus today. The Bible says that we are to repent, to turn from our sin, turn to Jesus, ask him to forgive you of your sins, and acknowledge him as Lord of your life, and God will save you.